So homework questions, if we look at page 178, number 19, the question says to evaluate without using a calculator. And the question that they set up for you was natural log evaluated at negative 6. So maybe at first you were thinking about this question and you're like, okay, well, the base of a natural log is e. So you're like, e to what power gives me a negative 6? And that, the fact that it's an e is tricky, right? You don't really know much about e other than it's 2.718-ish. So maybe then you investigate, well, what does a graph of a logarithm look like? Again, without a calculator, you guys should know that a basic logarithm kind of looks like this. So if I asked you to evaluate at negative 6, which is way over here, what's the problem? It doesn't even exist there. It's not defined beyond 0 because you can't evaluate a logarithm at a negative value. So what do you do when your teacher asks you to evaluate a logarithm at a negative value? You say it's undefined. There is a question just like that on your no calculator test. Okay, You cannot evaluate a logarithm at a negative value because of the domain restriction on the logarithm. It does not exist for negative values. Does it actually not exist or does it just not exist in real, real numbers? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good question. All right. What else? Are there any that don't actually, like, like things that like, well, don't exist in imaginary? Mathematicians would argue you could always create a number system that something always exists. <laughs> all this, math. This is all made up. Yep. Wait till you hear about today. We're going to talk about how adulting stinks and you should live in your mom's basement forever. <laughs> That's all that we're going to talk about today. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Say it again. Oh, for like change of base and stuff. Okay, so on the test, I'll give you ones that you can do without a calculator. So it'll be things like log base 3, 27. So you'll have to know like, okay, 3 to what power gives me 27, and then I'll think about it. And the other options, I'll give you a chart in case you guys aren't like savvy with the powers and stuff, but I think you guys could muscle through this one mentally. So those are the kind you're going to see on your no calculator test. Eventually in the future, you know, we'll have problems where there's applications where like there's no chance we can do it without a calculator. So we will be using calculators at that point. Okay? What else? Any other homework questions? <laughs> On which assignment, Scott? Page 178. Number 26. Can you read me the problem? I don't have it in front of me. Oh, okay. Well, we're just a match. Let's see here. Oh, with the word problem I see from the label of decibels on it. <laughs> so, everybody loves a good application question. Is it the uh, threshold of hearing problems guy? Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Sounds exactly <clears throat> right. 26. Yeah. So, while testing the speakers for a concert, an audio engineer notices that the sound decibel level Okay, reaches an intensity of 2.1 times 10 to the 8th watts per square meter. Um, the equation, which I'm just going to jot the equation down, D equals log of intensity, represents the loudness. What is the level of loudness? So this was not intended to be a nasty question. They just want you to plug in that number that they just gave you in the problem. So since it's a common log, you're going to type on your calculator common log of... 2.1 times 10 to the 8th power. And then it's going to come out to something, and then you're going to put a label of decibels on it. And that probably doesn't mean anything to you, unless you had like a reference for how loud something was, like something in your real life. Like there's charts out there about decibels, like sound of an airplane turbine. Like I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but rock concerts are pretty close to that. <laughs> so... Wear your earplugs, kids. <laughs> it's loud. Uh, this comes out to, I think, comes out to 8.3 decibels for this one. You just got to type it. I wouldn't expect you to know this one off the top of your head. Totally calculated that meal nugget, didn't you? All right, anything else? 
We can answer questions tomorrow as well, so I want you guys spending some time tonight and catching up on your homework if you haven't had a chance to. Yes, same assignment. Love to. All right, still page 178. Number 32 is... They want us to sketch, analyze the graph, describe domain, range, intercepts, asymptotes, and behavior, blah, 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 blah. Oh, how fun. Is that a one-fifth? I think it says one-fifth as a base. All right, so it says log base one-fifth of x. I have no idea what that looks like, right? All I know is there's going to be a vertical asymptote at zero. So when I get to the sketching part, there's literally just one thing I know. Well, two things, I guess. I know for a fact that because there's no transformation, there's going to be a vertical asymptote right here. I also know because there's no transformations that this logarithm will go through the ordered pair one zero. Beyond that, I got no clue. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss his inverse. It would be one-fifth to the x power. And I'm going to create a little table. And this one's kind of stinky. All right. Uh, let's go with are my favorite x's. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. All right. If I plug in a negative 2 into this exponential function, it would be 25. Cool. If I plug in a negative 1 to this function, I'd get a 5. That's not too bad. If I plug in a 0, I get a 1. If I plug in a 1, I get a 1 fifth. If I plug in a 2, I get a 1 25th. And this is all great, but is this who I want to graph? No, this is the inverse of what I'm trying to graph. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these ordered pairs and I'm just going to flip them around. So... <laughs> There is zero chance of me plotting this first one properly, but I'm going to give it a go. 1 25th, comma, 2. Yep, right there. <laughs> Nailed it. I don't even have marks on my axes. This is awful. Okay, and then 1 5th, 1. Uh-huh, right there. And then 0, oh, sorry, 1 0 I already plotted because that was like the one thing I knew. And then 5 negative 1. I'm just going to kind of pretend it's right here. And then, where am I at? 25, <laughs> negative 2. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, so you guys are getting this. Totally, this is so good. It's just wonderful. Hey, don't comment. I don't need your negativity in my life, Daniel. Okay, that is a beautiful logarithm graph. Now, why is this one looking so weird, besides the fact that I can't graph? Because this is not what your typical logarithms are looking like. We kept seeing them like this shape. But this is only if the base is greater than 1. If your base is between 0 and 1, like a fraction between 0 and 1, your logarithm ends up looking like this. Very atypical for logarithms. On our no calculator test, I would never give you one this unusual. It's going to be our good friends like log base 2, log base 3, log base 4, something boring like that. Okay? Good questions. Um, from here, I want you to answer all the other questions. Domain, range, intercepts. I think you guys got that part. All right, what else? Anything else? We can save all of our questions for tomorrow. You want to talk about how much it stinks to be an adult? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, can you find worksheet uh, four? It stinks because the banks take like yeah. Well, we're about to have percent of your money. Yeah. Give you like half. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to be using what's called the time value of money solver on our calculator. This let me find it. Hold on. There's a formula that is far more real life than anything you guys have ever seen. It's this formula. Okay, This is not the formula that we have you use in Algebra 2, because look at that baby. We're going to be using our technology to solve this, and this is the style of questions that real life really is revolving around. So you go and you purchase a car. You guys are probably more likely to purchase a car than go buy a house these days, right? Okay, especially after that time. <laughs> so you're going to purchase your car, and, you know, it's going to cost $15,000 and they're going to charge you so much interest, you know, a percentage, but you're going to make monthly payments. So every month your principal amount is going to decrease, but you're also adding interest to it. So they've kind of worked it out in a way where they know at every point in your loan how much money you owe, how much money they're making. So that's already been worked out. This is the formula that is used for an annuity. So annuity would be something where you're adding money or subtracting money constantly in the in the bank. So whether it be for a car loan, a mortgage, maybe you're doing like a retirement savers plan. Uh, I have like a 529 for my little babies where I just give so much money every month. 
very few people take like their six thousand dollars, dump it in a bank account, and walk away. Like that's all the problems we've been doing in Algebra Two last year was like, I have six thousand dollars, I throw it in the bank, and then I don't touch it for twenty years. Like, no, that's not how life works. So these questions are far more real life. Therefore, the math gets a little messy, right? We don't have to solve this. We have a solver on our calculator for it. And I am not ashamed to say that when I purchased my first car, well, I am ashamed to say this, uh, I did some bad choices. And I was not of the right frame of mind to purchase a car. I was nine months pregnant. And don't do that. <laughs> don't purchase I got bamboozled, like, bad. Because I didn't do the math ahead of time, and he was throwing numbers at me like a math magician. And then my poor husband's sitting there blinking at me because he doesn't do the math. He just figured I was doing the math in my head. And I'm just sitting there going, I can't wait for this baby to get out of me. And <laughs> I think I ended up paying more for that car than they originally said. It was it was bad. So the second time I bought my car, this gigantic nerd over here whipped out her TI-84 emulator on her phone. And I did my own calculations. And I bamboozled the finance guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm going to empower you to do this today. You ready? On your finance app, this is where you go get it. Okay, so it has to be on one of the newer calculators. If you have an older gray one, I don't think they have the app button. So if you go into app and you see finance, then you have it. And then the very first one within the finance menu is called TVM Solver. Pull that guy up. And if you don't have that on your calculator, go grab one of our yellow ones. Ooh. <laughs> It might not have that app. Oh, I got it. Yay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Good news. You can pull out your calculator to your next big purchase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing says nerd, like I, pulling a TI-84 yeah, out of your purse. Just pull this out of your back pocket. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I need to do my own calculations. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is where kids get a little confused because it's not quite the same as like our Algebra 2 formula. So when they say N with a capital N, they're referring to number of payment periods throughout the course of the entire annuity. So it's going to be like your lowercase n times the number of years. So if it's monthly for four years, it's 4 times 12. Okay? Which you don't even have to simplify. Like your calculator will do that for you. That's nice. Okay, here's another one that's a little different. It says interest rate, but as a percentage this time, not a decimal. So if it's 6%, you just write 6 if it's 4.5%, you write 4.5. You don't have to change it to a decimal like you would normally in the formula. It's already in the program that way. Okay, everything else is pretty self-explanatory. Present value is like right now, how much money do I have in this account? And oftentimes that answer is zero because you haven't put any money in. Um, sometimes you make an initial deposit or sometimes it's a mortgage or a payment where the present value is the entirety of the loan. Okay, payment is how much you're paying every month. So whether it be to the bank or whether it be to deposit into the account or whether the bank's paying you, not likely, um, it's what's happening every single month to change the value. The future value is what it's going to be worth in the future. And then the important thing about compoundings per year and uh, payments per year, these have to be the same. And it's usually 12. Because typically these problems collect monthly. Of course, the very first example we see today is going to be quarterly, so that kind of blows that out of the water. But 99% of the time, these problems are going to have monthly compoundings. And then the very end of it says, do you want to get your payment at the beginning or the end of the month? It defaults to the end, so just leave it that way. That way we all get the same answer. That's just one of those things sometimes the bank trick, oh, I'm not going to say tricks you, but they... Fiddle with the terms of the loan, so like if you pay it at the beginning, it does make a little bit of a difference versus at the end, but that usually only goes for like managing an incredible amount of money, which I don't think I'll ever do, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this first example. So you're going to want to write down what we're doing on our calculator. So first thing you should do is write all those little things out on your paper somewhere, and it, it goes in this order on your calculator. So like the first thing you'll type in is n and then you'll go over and type in interest and then you'll do present value and then you'll do payment so that's tip, that's the order that we're going to be entering them in <clears throat> all right so we have an investor who's gonna deposit six hundred dollars every quarter into an annuity so the annuity earns 7.24 percent interest and how much money will be in the annuity after 15 years 
So we can't use one of our simpler formulas from earlier in, in algebra and pre-calc because we're changing the amount every month. We keep depositing, so that changes things. So the n, it is going in quarterly, right? So we know that's a 4. But then we're doing this for how many years? 15, I think, yeah. So the n is 4 times 15, which you are welcome to change to 60. But you can just leave it as 4 times 15 when you type it in your calculator. The interest rate is 7.24%, so for the calculator's program, you're going to leave it as 7.24. The present value is like when he opened the annuity, how much money was in there? Well, child, you had nothing. We're about to make our first deposit, but we didn't have anything at the beginning. The payment is how much money they're throwing in every single, usually it's month, but quarterly in this case. So they're paying $600 every single time they compound. The future value is actually what we're trying to find. So what I want you to do is draw like a big empty rectangle and just write the word solve in the corner. This will make sense to you in a minute. And then payments per year and compoundings per year, they have to be the same thing. How many times are we making payments and compounding? Yeah, this is a weird one because it's quarterly. So they're both going to be four. Usually these are 12. So now you go to your calculator and you, you enter all that data. So apps, finance, TVM. And everything is over type. Um, so, whoops, what was this again? I already forgot. It was 4 times 15 or 60. You could just write 60. Yep. It'll change it to 60 once I pop down. And then it was 7.24. Yep. Okay. And then we have no money right now. And I'm paying $600 every month or quarter, excuse me. Don't do anything in future value, just ignore it for a moment. Go down to payments per year and compoundings per year and change. Once you change the first one to four, it'll default the second one to four because it knows they have to match. Get your cursor back in future value. You might have something different in yours, but we're about to overtype it. So I have to command my calculator to do the calculations and actually solve it. So if you guys look above the enter key, written in, in my calculator, it's in green. It says solve. Do you see it? So while your cursor is in the thing that you're trying to solve, please do alpha enter. Alpha key to get the green one, right? Oops, I just hit the wrong thing. <laughs> alpha enter. There we go. Yeah, look at that. Now, it's negative, which freaks kids out because they're like, wait, does he owe $64,000? No. It's negative because somebody has to pay out the money. When he cashes out his annuity, like the bank or whatever person is cashing him like has to write a check for $64,000 and some change so that's why it's negative it's coming out of someone's account it's really coming out of his account they're just cashing it out okay so this is money write down appropriate money answer <laughs> these adult words yeah no literally all of these words. like uh annuity. annuity annuity is just basically an account where you you intermittently add or subtract money from it, and it collects interest. So it's just, just like the savings account? Mm -hmm. Savings account. Most people use it for retirement purposes. Like this poor dude, though, if this is his retirement account, he's in trouble. Well, maybe he's retiring at like 97. Well, I got real bad. Yeah, I got horrible news for him. <laughs> You're going to need a lot more than $64,000 in your account before you can retire. The current generation who's trying to retire right now um, needs over a million dollars before they can retire. Huh. Yeah. That's why you see a lot of our elders who just keep working. Because the longer they are willing to work... They like working. Well... It also gives them something. Sometimes, yeah. You won't see me doing that. The minute I hit that magic number, outie. I am out of here. I will go back to working at Baskin Robbins, and I will collect my pension. <laughs> no offense, teaching, but I don't think I can make 50 years of teaching. I think I might keel over. 50 years, that's a lot. There are some people here right now who will have to teach for 50 plus years. Yeah. How far is Dredge? Oh, Dredge, he's a, he's a 40, 40, 45. He's been teaching for 45 years. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So is he just trying to make... I don't know. I think he just really likes working. <laughs> All right. Let's try another one, guys. So we're not going to be hand calculating any of this. Oh, this one, I'm just going to warn you. This is where you're going to get real depressed and think, you know what? Maybe it's not so bad to live in mom's basement for a while, okay? 
This is what I wish someone would have explained to a young me a little more thoroughly before I became an adult. All right, here we go. You're going to borrow 107 and I kind of love this problem because it's perfect for today's market. Like this is the home prices that you guys are, would be looking at. This is the interest rate. It is the term of the loans. This is kind of perfect. So $170,000 that were taken from the bank. Um, this number right here is currently what the loan is going to take be taken out for. So that's the present value. So $170,000 is present value. We're going to be paying on our loan for 30 years, which is very typical for a mortgage. Um, and it's going to be monthly payments, it tells me down here. So for N, it's 30 times 12. Which you can write 360 or you can just say 30 times 12. The idea is you're going to make that many payments. The interest rate is 4.5%. So write it as 4.5 for the calculator. Mm -hmm. So you're paying an extra 4.5% total of that one right? No. No. It compiles. Yeah. <laughs> this it's this is, here, to throw out another word at you, Daniel, this is called amortization. Are you going to describe this word? Okay, so when you look at what they call the amortization report. So I can pull it up on my mortgage right now. It'll tell you how much I still have on my principal of my loan, how much I still have to pay off in interest, and it'll take my monthly payment and it'll say like this much of it goes towards interest and this much of it goes towards principal. And we talked about the banks front loading that. So like at the beginning of your loan life, it's very much loaded in favor of the bank. Almost all of your payment goes towards interest and very little of it goes towards your principal. So as a new home buyer, one of the smartest things you can do, if you can afford it, is to pay extra money on your principal every month. Like if you can afford $100 extra on your principal, you're going to see your loan go from a 30-year payoff down to almost a 15-year payoff, which is going to save you a lot of money. Um, and we can do the calculations on this app for that, actually. The other thing, which is less stressful, uh, they call it, what do they call it, equity accelerator. If you choose to pay your mortgage every two weeks as opposed to every month, so what you do is you pay your full mortgage, but you do half of it at the beginning of the month and half of it at the end of the month, you end up paying one full extra payment throughout the year. Think about that. If you pay 26, half of that is 13, so you end up making 13 monthly payments in the year. How do you get 26? 26 weeks in, uh, 26 bi-weekly. 52 weeks in a year, right? Yeah. So if you pay every two weeks, you're paying half your mortgage on the first and half your mortgage on the 15th of every month, okay? Yeah. So you end up making 20, uh, 13 full monthly mortgage payments, okay? Instead of 12. If you just paid on the first of every month, you'd make you'd pay 12, 12, 12, 12 every year. Okay. So, so what does the bank do with that extra mor mortgage payment? So like my mortgage payment is like $900. No, they take that extra money and it gets taken off your principal, which is huge. So just by paying your mortgage every two weeks as opposed so half of it on the first and half of it on the 15th, if you do that, you end up shortening your mortgage length by, again, almost half. Like it's crazy. It really accelerates your equity. So that's a pretty cool trick that banks don't want you to know about apparently because Hardly any of them offer it anymore. How many of the like, parameters in the mortgage contracts are negotiable? Uh, well, you can you can ask for an interest rate, but they base it on your credit score in the market. And you can try, but the banks don't really do much on that. Yes? The equity accelerator. The, when I originally had it, there was like a company, and that's what they did. And they were like, sign up for our equity accelerator. So they arrange it through your whatever, whoever owns your mortgage at that point. They arrange it so you pay every two weeks, and they do all that. That was pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, like your mortgage gets sold constantly, totally out of your control, because banks buy each other out. You know, they buy each other's loans and mortgages. And if you're like a low risk one, like you get sold all the time. So we've been sold like five times because apparently we're low risk. <laughs> so like every time we had to refinance or get sold, I have to like readjust all this business. So the easiest way as a as a consumer or a borrower at this point. If you don't want to go through a separate company, you just stash away, like, pay an extra whatever amount every month. Um, it's easier, like, on a younger person to pay every two weeks because I could, it basically helps me budget as a young person. As a 23-year-old, it was really difficult to start writing checks for, like, $1,000 every month. That was a, that was a big thing to do. 
<laughs> so doing half your mortgage, you know, every two weeks was a little easier for us to work on our budget. So that was kind of cool. So think about that. Now, we're about to do this problem, and I think you're all going to agree that, you know what, mom's basement's looking pretty darn good. Okay. Are you able to do payments ahead of time? Yeah. You can... Like some of them like have some of them have check. penalties for early payout. You got to watch your loan. Some of them do. Not so much anymore, but some of them do. Why would they have penalties? They want your money. They want like if you won the lottery the day after you bought your house and then you paid off your house, yeah. some places have penalties for that and they'll make you pay a certain amount. Yeah. Not because so much they were, anymore. They were expecting to make a money yeah. on you when they I mean, a lot of a lot of things on the government level have changed since that gigantic market crash because it was a bank failure. Aided by the government. Sorry, government. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a lot of things changed. And a lot of legislation happens because of, they went, oh, yeah, that was a really bad idea. Like, for instance, you know. All right. So we're going to try to figure out what the payment is going to be for us because we're curious, you know, how to budget our lives here. The future value, guys, you want to pay off the money. Like, you don't want to owe the bank any more money at the end of this loan. So your future value should be zero. And then we're paying every month. So your payments per year and your compoundings per year are both going to be 12. So go ahead and enter this data into your calculator. Don't worry about payment yet. But once you get everything else entered, go back to the payment thing. And remember, you're doing alpha enter to command it to solve. And this is like a really magical problem because this is pretty much how much my monthly payment was when I bought my house. So I really like this problem. <clears throat> is it 861.37? Yeah. Okay. So every month for the next 30 years, you got to pay almost $900 on your mortgage, right? You're like, I got this. That's like paying rent, right? Okay. And at the end of this, you'll have a house. And you'll have what's called equity in your house. So even if you decide not to stay for 30 years, if you decide to sell after 15 years, maybe you've paid off enough where you don't owe money and you can make a profit on your sell, okay? But let's talk about this. If you stay in your house for the full 30 years, how much money did you actually pay for this house? So you paid $861.37 every single month for 30 years. Whoa. You paid $310,093.20 on the house. That doesn't include any of your real estate taxes or any other utilities or anything, okay? So your $170,000 house, really, you paid a lot. You almost paid double, okay? And that's how it works when you buy things on interest. And unless you have $170,000 sitting around, that's how it's going to work. So what are some things you can do to kind of change that? Well, you can put some money down on it. You know, you can put 25000 down, lower your principal. Uh, you can make higher payments throughout the life of it. You can increase your equity that way. You can pay more frequently. You can take more off the interest, uh, off the principal quicker. God. But this, uh, I don't have $170,000 sitting around, so you have to go to the bank to buy your house, right? And I'm not saying to people, people sometimes listen to this and they're like, She's saying, I shouldn't buy a house. I should just rent forever. Not really, because what happens when you rent? You pay the same amount, and at the end of it, you don't have anything. <laughs> you walk away from your apartment, and then your landlord takes over. Okay, So you, you don't have any equity when you rent. So I'm not saying don't ever buy anything. But I am saying maybe put it off until you're ready. That's a don't lot of money, man. You're yeah, maybe as a beginning teacher, don't purchase a house on your own. Live in mom's basement for a little while. I'm okay with that. Can you guys find, um, well, you don't find it. Just flip over. Look at worksheet 4B. This is so uplifting. Let's look at some more questions. I have a question. Yes. So, like, how much is necessary for a person to make to be able to, like... like Live like, comfortably? So, yeah. Like, so if it's, like, say it's a, mm -hmm. a husband and a wife, mm -hmm. okay? Just them. They don't want to have kids until they're ready to have a house. Wow. How what would much, that be like? How much? How, how, <laughs> I don't know. I bet I could squeak by on some macaroni and cheese for a while. I don't know. Um, well. Like, I've heard numbers that vary from, yeah. like. Are you talking, like, uh, salary-wise or, yeah. or hourly? Okay. Well, do you have college loans to pay off, too? Huh? 
Do you have college loans to pay my, off at this my point? My plan is to not be paying off. Okay, because that's. I don't want to take out college. Mm -hmm. I think some of you guys need to make some more. Uh, that's why I'm going to rock that. Smart plans about your college experience. If you're going off to college and you don't have like a lot of it secured and paid for, one way or another, not in loans, then you should probably start at Rock Valley. Rock Valley is the best way to start your college experience for many reasons, but it's way cheaper. All right. Anywho, uh, digression. Um, so when we started, <laughs> I'm going to pause the video. Yeah, we'll work more on these tomorrow. Goodbye.